as ever it's Beethoven. <sighs> now, where's justice? <laughs> now, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Fine, but where is justice in this world? I shall speak of it in a moment, but I have my own personal tragedy, but what about the rest of the world? Hmm. Right. <sighs> it says it in one of the Psalms, they'll just be washed away, they'll be like chaff thrown into the fire. All the people who I mean, what was Hitler's comeuppance? <laughs> he committed suicide, didn't he? I think. I mean, how does that compensate for what he did? And that's just, I mean, there's Pol Pot, actually. That's when I was younger. There's all these skulls lined up. Millions of skulls. Human skulls. So, man's inhumanity to man knows no bounds. What can I do about it? Well, I am a Christian. I love God through Christ. For those who don't know, my own son committed suicide at the age of 18. He would be 28 or now on November the 12th. He was born in November the 12th, 1992. And as far as I'm concerned, his mother and the English state between them may as well have taken a knife and just sort of slit his throat. Quite frankly, in all the circumstances, the father, my former wife's father, Mr. Eric Bruin, had fucked his daughter. She escaped the house because the GP said, leave it. I knew nothing of this sexual abuse. During my marriage, I had an inkling of it, but she never spoke of it. I tried to get her to counselling and it was all my fault, which is rubbish. I was banned. They believed her lies and not my truth in the English courts at the County Court of Milton Keynes, number 351, Silvery Boulevard, a certain His Honour Judge O'Connor made the first decision. I then fought in the English courts for five or six years, no justice. Took it to the High Court twice, went to the European Commission of Human Rights, no justice. Hmm. So, in my personal life, I have this monstrous in justice. How does that compare with other people's injustice as well? Just as a, for instance, I am a white African born in Cape Town. My ancestor, William Ross, trained as Dr. David Livingston. So I was born in Cape Town and the Khoisan, the Bushman people. Right, they lived there for 30, 40,000 years. You used to be able to get a permit from the government, whatever he was, person. Right, they've lived there. You put your fences up, you put your cows there. So the, the people, the indigenous people, who've lived there forever, as far as they're concerned, need one animal 
to live, and they use every piece of this animal, the skin, the, everything, the hooves, the bones, obviously the meat, everything. We used to be able to get a permit from the, uh, I just can't think of it, it used to be called Betuana land, uh, Botswana now, um, to shoot this little person who is taking your cattle. <laughs> ha! Brilliant. The Aborigines in Australia, for instance, the American Indians in, in you know, America. I don't know. Just pick a people where us whites have turned up and trashed their local indigenous people. So... So there we are, that's the story. I'm alive, either my hair or my beard will I ever cut because I'm still living for my son, Robert Francis. That was his name. If I ever speak of this, I have to speak of my faith I've accepted God's will. He brought me together with that woman, my former wife, who shall be nameless. And she's an evil woman. She bore our son. And the story went on from there. I am still alive to tell the tale. God has given me this wonderful blessing of my faith and there it is quite frankly <laughs> for what it's worth the reason why I'm a Christian. I've moved into a new place. I'm sorting out the gas and electricity and, the, and all that stuff. Guess who you speak to? <laughs> you bring up British gas and you get through the call centre. Coloured. Okay, that's what they are. Half and half, black and white, coloured people in Cape Town. I just had a lovely long chat this morning, man, with some old oit from there. I get on with people like that. I've tried to work in the townships, Google Etu, Nyanga and Kailicha for what it's worth. I can do the clicks. Closer. That's the language. Mandela was closer. <laughs> Normally whites can't do that click. I can. Right, now, where is justice in all this? You can't sue a judge, so he's on a judge. Anyway, this is 25 years ago. He's probably dead by now, the judge. But I checked the legal precedents and you cannot sue a judge. Even if it gets completely wrong, you still can't sue a judge. They're immune from the prosecution of their, uh, if they make a uh, wrong uh, judgment. I checked at the big law place on uh, Victoria Street in London. I physically went there and looked at the actual law books. <clears throat> There's no one around anymore. Possibly the court papers are still at the county court. I suppose they've probably got to keep those. But my son, Robert Francis, I've thought of starting a foundation for other families, you know, who need emotional support and the like, and the children. I come from a good family. My grandfather was a guy's MD. Medical doctor from Guy's Hospital in London. My mother trained at Guy's. She was a maternity sister. 
I trained at Bristol University as a medical doctor, etc., etc. I, from a good, normal, solid, stable, middle-class family. And no justice for me English. Now, part of my problem is I'm living in Harpenden, Hertfordshire, where hurricanes hardly ever happen in England. Both my father, who fought on the Somme in the First World War, Kingsley and the Royal Norfolk, and my grandfather left this filthy, foul little England. So what am I doing here? You may well ask. It's an evil little country, headed up by a woman, the Queen, who is the head of state, but also the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. That's absurd. Charlie Boy's going to be the next king when she pops her clogs, unless they push it on to the next generation. Give us a break. He was shagging his best mate's Roman Catholic wife before, during and after his marriage, and he's going to be the leader of the church. Oh, please. Give us a break. What kind of state is this? England. It's a filthy, foul little state. We have just come second, Britain, British aerospace, in the manufacturing sale of arms. Second to America. They've just published the figures in the last 10 years. What a surprise if people use them. I mean, to me, it beggars belief. Actually, Sherry Blair, Mr. Tony Blair's wife, that was the former Prime Minister of Britain, who <clears throat> went along as the poodle to George W. Bush for the Second War in Iraq, they introduced this Crimes Against Humanity in 2002. Now, if you pay your taxes and the money is used I mean, man A, man B, man C. Man A wants to kill man C, and man B has the knife. Man B gives to man A the knife. Man A kills man C. Man B is liable for providing the knife. That is the logic of it. So anyone who pays a single penny of taxes in a Britain, for which the arms trade is a part thereof, is liable under international law and should be arrested, tried and convicted, therefore by two with. And that's not going to happen either, is it? Hmm. And the extraordinary thing is, this film may or may not be watched by half a dozen people. I'm not going to get arrested for this. That was it's possible. <laughs> that would be good, actually. <laughs> I'd have to explain why. Because I made a film telling them the truth. <laughs> In China, if I did this against the great leader Xi Jinping, I would be killed. Okay, the little thought police would just turn up where I live and kill me. I very much doubt that's going to happen in England. Hmm. If only I could do something about this. Just the injustice. Not my injustice. Forget my injustice.
I have to speak. I have various medical conditions. If I were to die now today, for instance, then I'm going to put this film up now onto YouTube so it exists, unless someone deletes it. Amen.